You were named after who, if I may ask? You know, I'm not quite sure <laughs> uh, who decided to call me Michael. Maybe it came from Yavitazu, uh, maybe not, I don't know. I see, I see. But they thought, uh, my mother told me that many years later, they thought that they called me Ferdinand, or that uh, sounded a bit queer, didn't fit in with the rest of the family, I don't know, something, something of that kind. <laughs> I remember you mentioned once that um, you were at a special school, that your father had organized a school uh, that was, had students from all over the country. I don't remember the date exactly. It must have been 1930, late 31 mm -hmm. or 32, maybe. Mm -hmm. That is when he made this uh, special uh, school. I must say, for that, that part of it, I was really very grateful for him because... Uh, the idea of it was to have uh, a number of young boys to join me. We started with about 12, uh, each one from a different uh, social class, let's say. We had some of the uh, industrialist uh, sons, uh, right down to simple peasants. One of them was the son of a train uh, mechanic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that gave me a good feeling of what the different parts of the country, each one from a different part of the country. I see. So it gave me quite a good understanding of uh, the way these uh, young boys felt and the way they thought. We were exactly the same, no privilege whatsoever between us. Mm -hmm. Even if we happen to be I'd say different than them, but that didn't come into it at all. Mm -hmm. We were all on the same level. You all as far same. as the teachers were and uh, the way each one of us behaved with each other, it was all the same thing. I w went out there in about 1926 or thereabouts, when I was five or six years old, and he was the same age. And I think the idea was that I would be a sort of companion for him. We went to Mamaya. In those days, it was just the one villa on the shore. And the whole of the beach there was empty. It was nobody there. We had ponies, and we rode up and down it. And we went up to uh, Sinaya. I remember going up there in the mountains, and then a short time in Bucharest itself. I wanted to ask you your, your mother's qualities, and we'll talk about those. But what would, would you say on your father's side were his strengths and weaknesses in his particular qualities as well? Uh, that's a rather long story in a way, but uh, not very pleasant. Right. The strength I had, uh, I got, was actually from my mother. I see. Because, you know, at that age, uh, between six and ten years old, you don't know every little thing that's going on in the background. Right. But you have a sort of a... Uh, how shall I put it, like an animal instinct, mm -hmm. if you can call it that. Mm -hmm. You felt a certain amount of things going on without knowing the details. Mm -hmm. So when all this uh, upset and trouble started with my father and my mother, and then he finally came back, I didn't even know him. Right. In 1930. I knew of him, but I didn't know him. Right, I see. <laughs> so it was a shock, mostly not so much for having someone I don't know that's supposed to be my father, but I could see that my mother was extremely unhappy. What's been the happiest moment of your life? Well, I think I could say is when my mother came back, after my father left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For that thing, I was really very grateful to Antonescu because he fixed that immediately. In fact, your father left Romania in uh, September in 19, 1940. Did you ever see him again? No. After then? And he went all over the world, didn't he? He was in Mexico and... Uh... No, he, he started in Spain, then he went through Portugal, then Mexico, Brazil. He I tried see. to get to the United States, but uh, they wouldn't let him in. Then he went back to Portugal. I see. Did, you, did he keep in touch during this time, or not really? With me, he tried to... He tried desperately to get me to go and see him. 
And that was rather an unpleasant thing because uh, you get to a point when you have to tell him what's what. <laughs> the relationship with Antonescu is a, a, a bit of a journey, obviously, mm. between the time in 1940 mm. when I suppose you started to interact with him, although it was quite limited from what you're describing. He, ke he kept running the government and kept you somewhat isolated. It reminds me almost a little bit about what you were saying about yeah. your father. No, he's a very funny character, he was. Because he was a good officer, but uh, he was, uh, what should I say, he was very jealous of everything around him. He had to be the first one. That's why he called himself uh, the word the conducator, and mean, which means the leader, like a Führer, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So he was very cool with us, you know, and um, this is being a little bit uh, going to psychology in a way because. Uh, he intensely disliked my father mm -hmm. for certain reasons which were perhaps justified. Mm -hmm. But then, in his mentality was, as the French say, I think, uh, as the father, so is the son, you know. Uh -huh. So he could not put himself in the mind that I was perhaps different. So he wanted to treat me as if I was going on the same Lying as my father, and God knows what I was supposed to be doing, you see. <laughs> That's why the relationships uh, with him and me were not at all very friendly. Did you keep in touch with the British royal family at the time when Romania... No, that was impossible. Mm -hmm. Not after the end of 1940, 41, it was not possible anymore. So the royal families of Europe at that point, because of political reasons... They were completely separated. <clears throat> completely separated. Mm. And even in, there were no informal contacts no. like that, I see. Did you feel, in a way, betrayed? Because I hear you saying that you risked your life on August 23rd. You took a huge gamble. But when you step back and think that you risked your life to ally yourself to an ally whom, in fact, had already sold the country down the river. What do you say to that? <clears throat> All through this period, from uh, 44 to 47, we were extremely unhappy. I don't say you could be hurt, but we were very unhappy and very disappointed. Because we were really hoping, sincerely hoping, that the United States and Great Britain would do something to try and stop the Russians from doing what they did. And um, American and British uh, missions that I had contact with here, they were to a certain degree also in despair because they saw exactly what is happening. He was let down, and I think he was quite right to believe that, but I think he was also look at the other side and realise that there is a limit to what is negotiating with Stalin, what you could get away with. Even though the Allies were winning the war, they couldn't very well tell Stalin, you're not going to have Romania if he wanted it, because were we going to go to war again over Romania? I mean, it's not really practical. I mean, nobody would have stood for it. So I think Romania was very unlucky in the sense that it, it happened to be a bargaining counter at that time. You were invited to a very significant wedding in the fall of 47. Yes, uh, I got an official invitation from King George through the British mission to come to the wedding of uh, Queen Elizabeth. So you went to the wedding in uh, November of 1947, mm. and there was at least one good event at this time in your life, I suspect. Uh, you met your wife-to-be, no? And when I already had met her a few days before, in the Claridge's we were staying, where we met was my mother, her mother, and uh, Queen Federica, and some others. So when I came from town, funny enough, I was in uniform with my future brother-in-law. I uh, came into the sitting room, they were all there, and she was there also. I didn't know that. I had no idea. I didn't even know who she was. <laughs> so that's how I met her the first time. At Claridge's? Yes. 
And um, after that, uh, we went around London, we get to see movies and saw different things in museums that I hadn't seen since before the war. And then we were going together, I went together with her. And from one thing to the other, we got to like each other a bit. So when we went to this party at the Luxembourg house, I think in a, in a sense I sort of half proposed to her there. And she said no. <laughs> She got a fright of me. <laughs> but anyhow, she accepted afterwards when we went back through Switzerland to come with me. I suppose I should ask you, many people thought you left with... Well, I think that some of them still think now that we're millionaires. <laughs> right. no. Because that is the propaganda that these people put through, that we left with tens and tens of wagons full of gold, full of God knows what, and all our riches and all that stuff, you see. And it, that's taken with some people. That's even today? And now, much less, I think, they really do realize that this is all a pack of lies and it's not so, but in the meantime... So, you come up against these things once in a while. Is there something about yesteryear that is missing from today? Is there something about those days that you miss? Yes, of course, it's <clears throat> very, very different, all this, but uh, even that period during the war, we, we felt so safe in our own country. We had the people behind us, wherever we went, we were at home, you know. Whereas after all these 50 years now that we've had the communists around here, mentalities have changed. Some people remember, others are trying to learn. They're still very warm, the people here, that's quite true. But, you uh, know, they become a little bit uh, fatalistic, so to speak. Uh, that's how things are now. Uh, what can we do about it? Uh, you know. These uh, Soviet uh, mentality that has been put in these people's uh, minds, they've taken a lot of initiative out of them. And you see that in everyday life, even in the villages. Uh, nobody can repair something or a little bridge and, uh, and uh, cross a ditch. And I asked one mayor, why can't you fix that thing? He said, well, we don't have the money. I said, it doesn't cost any money to take a brick and put it in its hole. No, no. They have to wait for orders. And that is what they've been doing all through this time, especially with Charles Sesko. They had to be told what to do in the 30s. I don't say things are perfect. Nothing is ever perfect. But at least the people looked to be happy. They were fairly rich. I mean, the peasants I'm talking about, they didn't know what the bank meant or anything. They put all their money under the, under the pillows. But they had it there. No, they don't. So if you think back at all these things and see well, what the system has left, the ruins. Do you think Gorbachev was a significant force and factor ushering in the end of communism? That's what? also a slight mystery for me. Why did he suddenly start changing? Did he see, have some sense he saw? Did he feel something different? It's difficult to know. Huh? I didn't have any contact with any of all these people, the Russians of any kind, except some dissidents all through these years. What do you think brought it down? Do you think it was Gorbachev? Uh, was it the Pope? Was it uh, Reagan, bring down this wall? What do you think finally brought it down from your point of view? It was very, very sad in a way. <clears throat> I don't understand quite why, but uh, all these horrible people that were running the country at that time, with uh, Ceausescu being the top of it, was it a simply political situation? What was one trying to do? I cannot quite make up. The great majority of all the different nations outside in the West, I don't think they quite realized what was going on. I'm quite convinced, absolutely, that all the 
special secret services, whatever you call them, they knew perfectly well what was happening. But when I kept talking to people, you just uh, felt it a bit like uh, water on a dog's back, you know, it, it doesn't even go in. And they say it can't be so bad, it's not this, you're exaggerating, I don't know what, you know. And finally, when uh, Ceausescu started throwing down the churches and ruining all the towns and all that, that's when suddenly somebody started to say, well, maybe it, there is something there, you know. But all those years before, when I was trying to explain in interviews or otherwise in private, very, very little went through. On the contrary, they were trying to tell me some of them that I should keep quiet, nobody should know what I'm doing, forget it. Well, that hurts, you know. Not hurts privately, but it hurts because what I was trying to keep the flame going for the menu. You see that all these people, Charles and all that, they put the red carpet off for all of them. It must have been a lonely crusade in a way. That was the most difficult part of all. It's extraordinary to think that you'd put so much of your life and effort um, to navigate the nation in the best way you possibly could, with the limits of, of power that you had. The most frustrating part of it all was knowing what is happening in Romania, and what's happening with the people here. And you uh, find yourself to be in a situation where you can't do anything. You know, it's, 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 it's an awful situation. It's trying to get all this thing through the people, you don't get much reaction to it. Why do you think Romania tolerated communism as long as it did? I don't think that they accepted it. They just couldn't do otherwise because there was as much being Latin, as I said before. The oppression was much stronger here than with the people in other countries that had more or less of an affiliation root, you know, Slavs and so on. We, we did not. We were more rebellious in a sense, mm -hmm. indiscipline also. And that's why they clamped down on us much more than any other of the countries. Mm -hmm. That's why, in fact, in 89, the change was a, a bloodbath to a certain degree that didn't happen in other countries. Because mm -hmm. they sort of prepared things differently over there. Here they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So then we blew up. In a way, do you now feel that the crown has won? That uh, so many of the things that you hoped for have, <clears throat> to some extent, been achieved? Well, for the last few years, at least, I think uh, it's beginning to have a better understanding among some of the people of uh, a little bit what we did and what perhaps, perhaps, what it means. But it still takes time, you know. You know, 50 years of uh, Soviet influence when you compare it to what how Romania progressed, it took many generations. And Carlo the first, when he modernized Romania, he there reigned for 46, 48 years and brought it. These people, in a matter of no time, they destroyed the whole lot, everything. Whatever was something, or whoever was something in Romania has been annihilated. And now I have to start from scratch. When Carlo I arrived, there was still something here. They had some politicians, they had people that had the proper feeling for the nation, patriotically speaking. All this has been wiped out. Even if you feel for your country, but from there to try and understand it all and clear it all up is very difficult, you know. There's no system that I've seen, even the Nazis. They never did anything like that with us. They did it perhaps in other places because... But these people from the Soviet Russia managed to do things a thousandfold worse than anybody else. And that is something that's obviously hurt us very much from our point of view that the West did not understand. The internal damage. They understood it was bad, but not to the extent. 
Well, it's all this thing which we were saying now with this 50 years of cunningness. And the way they infiltrate people, the way they search people's families and things, it's, 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 it's beyond imagination for some people, you know. How long, do you have any idea how long something like this takes to cure? Does it take a generation, two generations, or what's your thought on that? Well, I think it all depends very much on uh, the people that uh, follow all this. Uh, you can't do this and just clap your hands and press a button and finish. You know, this is something, another thing that I've, I've seen people don't understand in the West because we always talk about democracy. Democracy up and down all over the place. That is what we want to get to. The United States, let's say, it's compared to our world, it's a young nation. They managed to build their democracy as years went by from the very beginning, after the Civil War and other things. Europe didn't have exactly democracy before, but anyhow, it existed more than in our parts with all the barbarian invasions and all that we had, and then this is the worst one. You can't expect here or anywhere else uh, of a country that's been in this situation if they suddenly say, well, now we've got democracy, it doesn't exist. You said in the 2003 address to the Romanian people, you said the biggest enemy of Romania remains our internal divisions. What did you mean by that? Dissensions, because people don't seem to, after all this period we've had, they don't seem to get together and think together. That is where the, I wouldn't say perhaps the word of danger, but it's the difficulty we have, because uh, in olden times when uh, all the education was different, uh, people stuck together much more. Now the system has spoiled their characters to a certain degree. They sort of overlook a whole lot of things that were never accepted ever before. So that is why dissensions, uh, lack of perhaps discipline, and lack of uh, solidarity of many people is, makes things very difficult for uh, the way to run things. In that sense, I mean. What are things, as you draw from your own life experience, that you think well, as far as I've noticed in this world today, and that's not specific one place or another, is that there's uh, too much politics. Too much of this is done for a party or for several parties, the whole week it up and so on, and I think they've uh, lacked a bit to think of the ordinary man. This, the lower class, look, it's not a nice word, this, the lower class, but I mean the ordinary man, less educated than some of the others, which are living in uh, very difficult conditions, and here too. Now, with all this politics going on, who's going to win what and so on, uh, they seem to neglect a bit of all this. Instead of trying to, that's also the old uh, Soviet system, they're trying to level out society, but they do it the wrong way around. They level from the top back down, instead of trying to bring up the others. I also think there's something else there. There's uh, the faith that we used to have before. And our belief in God and so on has uh, gone very low. Very low. Quite frankly, I must say, I was shocked when I saw this in the United States and some other places, they're trying to get the prayers out of school. Although it says, in God we trust, and then we see other things saying, we must keep that aside, we can't put it because it's anti-constitutional, so on, all the rest. I remember in my school, when we did that, every single morning we started with saying the prayer of Father. No matter, and we had, of course, the majority were orthodox, simple people, some were higher up. We had a Saxon who was a Lutheran. We had a Hungarian which was Calvinist. And one, I think, other was a Catholic. Well, that didn't come into it. The Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer for everybody. See, we don't distinguish between this thing. So if I feel if people have a little more depth in their belief in Christianity, 
maybe things would be a bit different. Because uh, some people didn't like this, what I've said sometimes. I talked to some of the priests and you have people that are Christians, or supposedly Christian. It's quite true that churches are filled up here in countries like this around here. But they go to church, they listen to service and so on, and then they come out and do the same thing as before. At the difficult moments in your life, do you pray to God in particular? Well, that was also inspired, brought into me from my mother, because she was a, a deep Christian, the same thing as King Paul of Greece, which was, for me was one of my most appreciated uncles of all. He was not, how shall I say, a church goer just to go to church to show himself around. He was deeply Christian in his, his heart and his soul. My mother the same thing, and that is what uh, was put into me. Because I realized so much when you get to a certain position and some of your ideas or ideals have been destroyed or spoiled by circumstances, if you don't have something to rely on, like belief in God and Jesus. No, God, what's left? Nothing left. You go to pieces with it. What do you think is the better, best advice you've passed along to your daughter? Well, the thing that kept me going, uh, besides my mother, was this belief in Christianity and God and the prayers. Because that is something I think should be vital in anybody's life. And unfortunately, you see it uh, rather slipping mm -hmm. too much. You mentioned uh, about how politicians, there's too much politics in the world mm -hmm. today. What do you think kings have that presidents don't or prime ministers don't? I think one fairly simple thing is that, uh, let me put it like that, if God has put us in a certain position to be born in a certain way, in a certain place, it's for life. Whereas the president, no matter how good and how exceptional he is, he's a party man. And it's every so many years he gets changed or elected or so on. We don't have these problems. We're there for life. And um, at least what we should do is to keep a continuity, no matter who comes in the government or all the rest. But it's, it's uh, not exactly like a referee, but to a certain degree, you see, when a referee sees that something doesn't go well, he takes a whistle and blows it. He doesn't let it just go to pieces. No, that's what you're there for. And. The notion of a constitutional monarchy, which, or a monarch playing a role in, like in Spain <coughs> or England or elsewhere, well, is that such a bad idea for Romania? Well, we had it and it worked. Um, <clears throat> there I might add one thing, that our constitution that was proclaimed by my grandfather in 1923 was taken as a model from Belgium. Oh. Now, many of the things in the Belgium one and ours are the same except for a few specifics. And there's one specification in ours, like in Belgium, it says that the king names and revokes his ministers. Whereas in other places, what they think democratic is that the parliament of some of the years should elect these people, no matter who they are, what the quality is. They just have to be. Whereas we could select. You can't just take anybody off the street and put him in the, you know, it's easy. There's a certain selection to have a minimum of guarantees that uh, your government is going to work properly. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you can interfere in every day enough, no. That's not our job. But our job is, in a way, to keep things going properly. Do you regret to look, when to you look after the, the, the smaller people also. Mm -hmm. 